welcome to the Community Voice Channel. I'm Ivy Tu, your host for CBC Interviews. And today I have Mary C. Garrett, who is running for the 35th Senate seat this coming November. And I think that today this interview will be great to understand who she is, her beliefs and values, what she plans to do if she goes to Hartford, and everything else about her. So hello and welcome. Thank you for Hi. joining us here today. Thank you. And I'm going to say when I go to Hartford. Oh, a lovely. <laughs> <Absolutely>. I'm manifesting. <laughs> manifesting is oh, good. Yes. So who are you? Like, tell us about yourself. I am a mom, a friend, a neighbor, a retiree, um, honestly, a really dedicated citizen to my district and honestly, really to the state of Connecticut. I've lived here my entire life in the eastern portion of it. I've worked in Connecticut all of my life, from being a child of 13 working in the tobacco fields to retiring from its boardrooms and its conference rooms. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's who I really am at the core of it. And of course, being a mom, number one, a wife, number two. <laughs> but you know, my mom, my, uh, yesterday, our daughter awarded me on my mom ship. So Aww. she said I had to, to mention that today. So thank you for Oh, asking. that's beautiful. And um, you live in Tolland, right? Yes. And you've been there for over two decades? Yes, yeah. well over 20 years. And I've been married for over 30 years. Mm -hmm. And once again, my husband, even our child, we spent the majority of our lives here in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So you have an incredible resume. So what has inspired you to go out for the 35th Senate seat? Um, it really started um, with a town council run. Um, we were coming down to the last maybe three, four weeks of that election cycle and we desperately needed a candidate so that we would not go, un that position would not go unopposed. So they called on me and as I do, I stepped up to the plate and agreed to run for the seat. And from there, we ended up gaining a seat and we also, my election was so close it had to be recounted. Mm -hmm. The only expectation of my position particular run for just a few weeks is that I would get a few hundred votes and help us just retain what we had. Mm -hmm. But we exceed, far exceeded those expectations. And after that election was over, I had numerous people from both sides of the aisle, Republican as well as Democrats and even unaffiliated asking me if I would run for anything else again. And I was like, anything? I think they wanted me to run for literally anything. <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm more of a analytical person. So I was like, I don't know. So I, you know, I'm not going to give a commitment I could not give. And we discovered that we needed definite help here or there, I should say, in the 35th district. Um, after I did lots of research, other people, you know, also filled me in, and I decided to go for the Senate mm -hmm. because right now we have almost no representation whatsoever. We have someone who is filling a seat, and really that's, you know, in taking photographs, but really that's mm -hmm. it. So what exactly does the 35th Senate seat person do? So what we do is we try to get funding into our towns. So there's 13 towns in this district. They're spread all across the northeastern part of Connecticut. Kind of clustered, but you know, these are towns where you have lots of land, but the populations are not hundreds of thousands or even tens of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. um, Vernon is the most populated of all of the towns in the district. And what we found is that we were just constantly, as we are going through right now in Tolland, desperate for dollars to not cut from education, not cut from infrastructure mm -hmm. and other needed resources for the town. So we're not even asking for updates and upgrades. We're just asking, can we please maintain what we have without balancing budgets on the backs of our mill rates? Right, so your role is really to fundraise essentially for Correct. the district. Yes, and to be the, if you will, like the cheerleader of the district. You know, in the Senate, 
you're fighting, you know, with every other senator there that's from one of these towns representing, you know, a variety of towns in their districts. And we all need money and funds. The thing that I saw is that some senators were definitely doing the job of getting what they needed for their district and others seem not to do that. Mm -hmm. And it is a party thing, you know, to be honest. In the Senate right now, the Democrats have the majority and therefore it seems as if Democratic senators are getting what they need for their districts. And some Republicans are as well, so I won't say that okay. it's not happening on both sides, but I know in the 35th, we are desperately lacking. Right, so what would like you describe something, somebody as like a good leadership, um, somebody who's going to step into that role, like how would you describe mm -hmm. good leadership and these beliefs, like how would you, where did these beliefs come from of yours? I mean, mine come from, honestly, it goes back to that my years in Alabama with my grandmother and her telling me stories of the struggles that they had to go through, um, honestly, just to survive every day. And so I, that's real, I get a lot of my, I would even say my morals, uh, the, some of my, um, the way that I simply live my life, like a lot of that really comes from that foundation. Mm -hmm. But what someone needs really to be an excellent senator is they need to listen to the people who live in their district. Mm -hmm. They need to know the people that live in their district, not just show up after people in the district have done the work to take a picture with a check that they didn't help them earn. They need someone who's going to help them earn those checks. Mm -hmm. And they need someone who really is going to show up for them in the worst of times. Like this budget cycle that we're going through, we consider it to be like a tornado. Yeah. In Tolland, it'll be the third time that we're going to referendum. We may possibly be going a fourth time. And there's other towns out there in this district that have gone multiple times. Some of them have finally had a budget passed, but not without New, I can't tell you how many cuts that they've had to take to yeah. pass them. So on that topic of like values mm -hmm. and morals and beliefs, one of your slogans is vote for Connecticut values. Mm -hmm. So what are Connecticut's values from your perspective? Uh, it's really being neighborly. It's getting to know each other. It's getting to understand each other, helping each other when we need it, supporting each other when we definitely should be standing together. That's usual. I mean, you could break down on the side of a road here in Connecticut and some stranger is going to stop to help you. Mm. I've done that myself, you know, regardless of, you know, how my husband felt about it, but <laughs> sometimes people need a hand and that's what we do in Connecticut. And we also usually take each other along for the ride. So we try not to leave anyone behind. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned earlier that the budgets, there's a lot of issues and tensions there. Um, maybe is this related to complex problems in society or um, is there other reasons for why budgets aren't passing? It, in Connecticut, it really isn't about society as a whole. What it's about is knowing how to get those funds so that versus you know, you see another town next to you where everything seems prosperous. I have this phrase that I use, they're swimming in milk and money, and then we're over here struggling, or I know there's one town in my district where one of the people from one of the DTC said to me, and this is in front of a group of people, is like, Mary, we were fighting over $50. $50 in a budget that's millions. And, but it makes a difference because if you don't have enough, you just don't have enough. It doesn't matter what enough the number for what? is. For education, for the infrastructure, to work, you know, just make sure you maintain your roads the way that they should be maintained. And there are people who have, um, you know, issues that need addressing in society as a general. So sometimes at the school system, it's not just about general education, but special education, making sure that we have the paraprofessionals there that are needed to help kids that might need a little more of a hand. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so um, on these topics, um, can you talk to us about the affordable health care, or sorry, affordable housing, housing. and um, yes. your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm very passionate as well about affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, I purchased my first home when I was 21, and I wasn't under an affordable housing plan. But because of that purchase, I was able to build wealth myself. I am not a wealthy person, but I was able to build enough wealth. And, and that's because I owned something that was tangible. I was gaining you know, equity every time I made a mortgage payment. And then I was able to sell that, make a profit, you know, move into another place, and you saw a cycle kind of created itself. And I know other people who have done the same. And so my part of my plan, if you will, that I would submit has to do with affordable housing, but through home ownership. Mm -hmm. But I know there are other people who need homes or need to downsize and they don't want to necessarily own a home. Like for example, our seniors out there that are living in you know, three, four or five bedroom homes, but they can't afford not to live in those homes because if they were to simply pay rent, mm -hmm. it would be so much more than what their monthly expenses are now, they couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. So I like the idea of, it, of an inclusive housing solution. The words affordable housing, um, I know Someone had used the words um, housing projects. They, they just have a negative feel to certain individuals. Mm -hmm. And especially if you live in country towns, which is what I kind of represent, mm -hmm. you know, no one wants to, to imagine there will be a 30-foot structure going up or 10,000 units somewhere. They want something that's going to be integrated into their town that looks and feels like the rest of the town. Right, and uh, would you say that that's the crisis, is that the, these places aren't there yet? Absolutely, mm -hmm. it, they're not there. So what happens, we have our kids that go off to college or trade school or whatever adventures they want to go on. They come back home, if you're lucky, and I say that because if they come back home, they're probably literally coming back to your home mm -hmm. with mom and dad because in their town, where can they afford to live? There's like nowhere. Yeah. Um, there's either not enough housing, which is really a big issue, or the housing that's there is so expensive, they can't afford it. Yeah, yeah definitely, and your plan is to provide that. And like Correct, exactly. Yeah. There are solutions to it. We just need to be brave enough to think outside of a standard box. Right. Um, so, what is your stance on women's rights, and um, why is that important to you? How will you be able to bring that into your reign or like your term mm -hmm. as um, a Senate leader? So, my thoughts, just as an overall, is our bodies are our bodies, and women's health, however anyone wants to define it, is health that deserves health care. So how anyone could ignore it, how we can go backwards the way we have with Roe v. Wade is just honestly, to me, unacceptable. I just don't get it. You know, at some point, um, federally, something could have been done to ensure that this never, ever happened. And that is something that I would want to work towards with, you know, there's people, I don't know if I should mention them, but who are, you know, in the... In Washington, D.C., there are people who are, are um, state representatives, people who are senators that you know work literally out of Washington that we can work with to ensure that we never go backwards again. And also, my opponent voted against HB 5424, which protects doctors who perform women's health care services. Um, and most of the services that are listed in that bill are life-saving. If you don't have those services, they're life-saving. You will probably perish. So why would someone who is a doctor go against that? I, yeah. it, it behooves me. I just don't get it. Mm -hmm. But we learned today that, thankfully, a drug that helps at least a million women a year um, with unwanted pregnancies, federally, the judges decided, you know, it went to the su Supreme Court, and they decided that there was no reason for us not to have that as an option. Mm -hmm. 
So yay to the <laughs> Supreme Court. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what are your thoughts on gun reform? Um, you know, some people don't like when I say this, but as you can tell, I just, I am who I am. I say what I need to say. I grew up in a family where guns were acceptable. My father hunted, my uncle hunted, my cousins old enough to be my uncles, mm -hmm. they hunted as well. And as long as it's responsible and makes sense, and we have protective laws around it, which we should have, mm -hmm. I don't have an issue with gun ownership, but I do have an issue with automatic weapons what I call weapons of mass destruction. There is no need for any citizen to have a weapon like that. It doesn't make any sense. You're not, I mean, if you're in the United States military active and you're, you know, working on a conflict, that's a whole different story. But you're in your home, you know, here in Connecticut. Like, why do you need such a weapon? It's just not necessary. Mm -hmm. So now that we've addressed, like, some issues and um, things that will probably come up, Mm -hmm. in your term, how do you plan to really like attack them and bring them to discussion? Well, the number one thing that most people don't understand is that in order to enact any legislation, you have to work with the other people who are senators, you know, working on legislation as well. So my I've worked across the aisle before I ever ran for office, working with Jody Rell, who is a Republican, to work through the Governor's Prevention Partnership to create a corporate mentoring program. And in that program, one of the things they did not have was background checking, which I was shocked and appalled by. Mm -hmm. But I worked with an organization where we were checking backgrounds all the time. Yeah. So um, that was part became part of their program for mentors and as well as just putting a structured program together. And we did that wonderfully, beautifully. It was, you know, honestly, one of the highlights I felt of my career. And it was something that I did as a volunteer more than anything else. Mm -hmm. But if we can't work with those that are on what people sometimes call the red side, the blue side. I call it any side. <laughs> I like to think I can be purple, you know, if you want to blend all the colors together, um, the unaffiliated folks. If we can't work together, we will never come to a great solution mm -hmm. that will benefit the masses. You know, we might come to little solutions that help a few people, but our state as a whole, lots of people are making it every day, but they should be able to do more than just make it. Sure. So it sounds like working with the other party is something that's really important to you. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what unity means to you and like how you plan to show that during your time? Yeah, I mean, the way that I, like I said, working together with others, as long as, I mean, we have to make sure that we're working on things that are productive. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, uh, things that I, are passionate to me or things I specialize in. I feel as if we could definitely make some changes. The other thing really is, and I said it earlier, being brave. You know, there are people who will not speak like me. They will not be as passionate as I am. You know, they're more concerned with their image because they still have a business or a career that they're still, you know, working on. I'm retired. I can be as free as I need to be to get whatever we need done. Mm -hmm. You know, for a retired woman, you are very busy. I'm busy. Yeah. <laughs> You're not really uh, taking a break. <laughs> so I like being busy. Yeah, of course. So what decisions do you plan to make as an elected leader in Hartford that will benefit our community in the short and long term? Well, some of the things I would like to do is at the town level, start there, um, as I've already done and have been doing for at least like two and a half, three years, is really digging into every town in the district. Like I said, there's 13 of them, so and I'm all over the place zipping around in my little red car. Um, but really to understand more so what the people want and need. Because although we're all in the same corridor, mm -hmm. every town, even though it might even look a little bit the same, there's, there's definitely different needs. Mm -hmm. So more so than me always telling people, this is what I wanna do for you, this is what I think you need, mm -hmm. is also listening. So listening to them, 
getting their perspective. A lot of them know more than I do, and I'm the first to be honest and admit that. Mm -hmm. And also to get them involved. Mm -hmm. So it's not just me over there, you know, at the Capitol. It's, you know, me bringing them in for meetings and for things that I know that they're interested in so that we can really make a difference out here. We're tired of being an afterthought. Yeah, so what makes you, like what sets you apart from your, the incumbent, um, with Jeff Gordon? Like what would you do differently? Um, you know, I don't care to take photographs. <laughs> so I, I, you know, my thing is if I am in a photograph it's because I had something to do with why, you know, there's a purpose for me to be there more than promoting myself. So mm -hmm. I'm not really a self promoter. Um, the other thing is, like I said, because of my relationship with Connecticut, and I do think of it as a relationship, I've worked here my entire life. I've gone to school here, but I did also take classes at Cornell. Um, I also have raised my family here. We plan on retiring here. It was a conversation my husband and I had a few years ago, and I was like, you know what, I'm not going anywhere. but. You know, hopefully you want to stay here with me. He's like, oh my God, really? Yes, mm -hmm. Connecticut means that much to me. And if you're not fully vested in it because you don't have your business here, you don't work here, which he does not, um, and you live on the outskirts of it, but you never really come into the interior or investigate any other part of it, mm -hmm. I don't know how you could fully do your job, right. you know, to to the best of your ability. And your plan is really to show up. Yeah, all the time, and I already do. And it's and this and that was before I started running for this position. Mm -hmm. So, what sort of expertise or knowledge can you bring that's like special in particular to you? Mm -hmm. uh, well, my background is in business. It's also in diversity and insurance. So I consider myself a business woman. Um, that's how I've been titled throughout my career. And so I, play, I see government as a business. I know some people try to separate it. it. It's not, it's a business. It's a constantly moving machine. Think of it as a giant corporation and lots of money and you know going back and forth here and there that we need to manage and ensure that, once again, we in the 35th district get our fair share. Mm -hmm. Sure. So what is something that's surprising about you that we should know? Something maybe not related to politics or Oh, gosh, there's run. so many things. <laughs> well, I'm a mixed media artist. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't even, <laughs> you people sometimes recognize me or they think they know who I am from somewhere, but that's because I've been in numerous television shows I've been in movies wow. etc so I've done um, some advertising you know, like through commercials etc so yeah the, and I love gardening gardening and hiking are two of my big loves do you have a favorite hike in um, Tallinn County or within your district uh, honestly anywhere wild I'm unfortunately the person you probably don't want to hike with <laughs> unless you keep me in order because I will want us to go off the beaten path okay oh yeah so, <laughs> we've off the lost beaten too path many oh yes yeah <laughs> because that's where all the treasures are everyone saw everything on the regular path mm -hmm. cool so is there anything else that you would like to add um, just that I hope that people come out and vote November 5th it will definitely make a difference to our state. And remember that when you're voting, yes, we have a presidential election going on, but vote all the way down that ballot because where your dollars and cents are spent when you pay your taxes, for example, mm -hmm. sales taxes, mill rates, car taxes, et cetera, those are going to your town and to the state of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. It depends on which one you're paying, of course, but mill rates stay in your town. And if you don't vote all the way down the ballot, then you're kind of like just leaving funds on the table that your town probably needs. And also, in order to get the resources you need, we really need people to vote for us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mary, for <laughs> being you. here. Um, as you know, she will be running for the 35th Senate seat. 
And thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope that this was a very informative talk to have. And we hope to see you again at another CBC Interviews. Thank you. Thank you.